the last. I'm gonna record. Let me let me share my screen. So I'm gonna share a screen here. I do want to show you all a couple things as we're getting started today. First off, I have just put on to, uh, into our curriculum um, into here a, a sign up, a CCNA two sign up. So if you want to take CCNA two for free, starting September eighth you're allowed to add one discussion topic. And what I want you to put is your name and email. That's it, nothing else. Add one discussion topic, each one of you, put your name and email address in here um, at the end of the week and you know, the end of next week, whenever we get everybody in here, we will get you signed up for free for CCNA 2. So if you want to take CCNA 2, make absolutely sure you get your information on this CCNA 2 sign up for me, okay? Any questions about that? All right, let me do this and let me show you what I'm talking about um, with my handy dandy, wonderful. So let's imagine that I have uh, 10.1.1.0 slash 24. All right, and let's say I need 100 hosts, uh, 30 hosts, and then um, two by two hosts. Okay, so basically two slash 30. So one of the first things I could do here is I could go out here and go, I, can y'all see my screen? Can you enlarge it? Uh, yeah, I can do that. I'm uh, sorry for interrupting. Oh, no, no, no. All right, trust me, uh, I got old eyes too. Not saying you got old eyes, Tom. Not saying that at all. That's okay. Just, just understand completely. All right. Thank so let's you. Say, That's much better. Much better. Okay. Let's say we want to slash 25 here. So now what we're going to do then is we're going to break this apart and we'll have um, our magic number slash 25 is 128, right? So this will be zero to 127. And we've also got um, 128 to uh, 255. All right, everybody good there? Everybody understand that? What we just did? Yes. Okay. Now. What, Michael, what the curriculum teaches you is you need 100 hosts, right? So right. this would be a subnet for 100 hosts. The curriculum teaches you to pull this subnet out right here. So for this 100 hosts, the curriculum would teach to do 10.1.1.0 slash 25 and to pull this subnet out. And then it would say, okay, now we're going to go down here and do slash 26 and slash 26. We're going to take this. And we're going to break this down into, uh, let's see, it's 128 to, uh, I might need some help here, folks. Uh, 64 would be 191. 192. 191. Yep, 191. Yeah. And then 192 to 255, right? Correct. Now, this is still too big because it's a 62 host per subnet. So we could go down here and the curriculum would say do a slash 27. Um, so now we're going to do this, which is uh, 128 to, it's 32 now, so uh, help me out somebody. What is that, 159? Is that correct? 159. Yep, I think that's right. And then 160 to 191, okay? Now, the curriculum would then state that we would pull this network out right here to be our 30 host. So we would have 10.1.1.0, .1 not zero, 128 slash 27. And then we could go on down further down in here to get our slash 30s. Okay, everybody agrees with that, right? Well, it's perfectly valid to do the following, folks. It's perfectly valid to do this. Okay. All right. And then now, We have zero to 63, 64 to 127. Okay, still too big, right? Because we need only need 30 hosts. Um, so we have zero to 31, uh, 32 to 63. Now we pull this one out. So now this is 10.1.1.32 27. And then the easy thing now is I know I can go out here to slash 30 and I've got zero to three and four 
to 7. That could be my two slash 30s. So see, it works exactly the same. The curriculum is always teaching you to pull the, the bottom one first. You get your biggest first and then pull it out. But there's no reason you can't use the upper subnet as your big subnet. You still find your biggest one first, Michael. But where you pull it from is where the variability comes. And both of these are valid. Neither one of these would, would, would violate any rules. There's no rule that says you can't use them this way. As long as you're not overlapping, everything's perfectly fine. Does that make sense? And by the way, to get to this zero to three, all I did was is I did a slash 28. And that was obviously zero to 15. And then, oops, and then 16 to 31 and then slash 28 all the way. You know, I just kept doing my subnetting all the way down through. So. Just be aware of that. I didn't do anything magical. I just knew that that was going to be zero to three, four to seven, eight to 11, so on and so forth. Okay. Does that make sense? Does that help? That's, that's very helpful. I, I didn't think about it like that. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been, I've been doing it the whole way, the other way, but I see it doesn't, it's, it's actually maybe simple. So simpler to do. I it. think it, for me, it's a whole lot simpler because I'm not trying yeah. to figure out one, 159, 160, all that stuff. I'm not trying to figure all that out. I can use numbers I know off the top of my head. Right. So, and the other ones are can be off the top of your head too because if you use them enough, you'll, I mean, you know, I, I knew it. But, you know, but, kind of dig into the recesses. But based on packet tracer, they're looking for those numbers and organization. Bingo. Yeah, yeah no, because you have to do it that way, the other way, or you won't get any points for it. Agreed. Uh, but I think we do our students a disservice if we don't mention to them. Right that it's not a mathematical reason. It's not anything to do with BLSM, the reason we're doing this. That's just the choice Cisco made. Because if they go right. out in the real world and they sit down at their business and their business tells them, no, 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 this is how we do it. And they'll be like, well, you can't do it that way. Yes, you can. Um, it's just where you decide to pull your subnets yeah. out of. As long yeah, as it I, meets the slash notation and there's no yeah. overlap, you're good. Uh, when, I, when I work for Cisco, I work with them for about 20 years. And we always went inside of the network to try to throw things off. Right. Uh, as far as assigning the VSLM to the uh, uh, to the system. So I, I definitely understand what you're saying. Okay. And the other thing there just to add to it is consistency. Yeah. Right. Whatever you, if, especially going into a, a workplace, they, they're gonna probably already have a way of doing it. That Correct. way, uh, that, trust me, I, I've dealt with that, so. Yeah. <clears throat> So whatever, you really don't. And, you know, whatever your business does, <laughs> that's what you do. You know, when they tell you to do it that way, you do it that way. Um, yeah. And normally they just give us the calculator and say, here's the IP yeah, address, yeah. figure it out. And then you don't do any of this stuff when you get in the real world, almost. But you still need to know it because interviews are important. Oh, yeah. Make sure you understand how to do it. All right. Perfect. Uh, any, any other questions on that? For I'm, I'm turn over to Michael to work on the... Uh, uh, finishing up on IPv6. Any questions on IPv6 before Michael takes back over? Apologize for not being here last week. And Tom, uh, apologize for not being at the NCDPI meeting. Um, tested positive for COVID last week after coming home from Argentina. So uh, I've been out of work for a couple of days. Thankfully, no big deal. It's just just like a cold. Um, so still still kicking. So all right. All right. Well, I I. Uh... I was actually looking for the recording of last uh, week's, last Wednesday's meeting. Okay. I couldn't find it. Did it I overlook should be, it? It should be in our, if you go to our uh, Zoom session recordings, down at the okay. bottom, down at the bottom, uh, there's the, the recording is there and it has a, um, or did we put that one in there, y'all? I think we did. Was it July? I don't know. I don't see it, y'all. Did anybody put it on the the recording from last week? Because I'm not showing it either. I think it might have came to your email, Kelly. It might still be in your email from the cloud recording. Okay. Well, somebody's got the cloud recording. Have y'all got it? Because I don't know if I've still got it. I don't know. No, it doesn't come to us because you set the original meetings up, so it'll come to you. Well, I'll have to go mean? try to find a darn thing then. All right. Let me go see what I got. I'll see if I can uh, find it. I thought y'all had it. I hope you get it to feeling better soon. Oh yeah, like I said, I don't feel bad. I'm, I'm, I was a little rough last week, but not bad this week. So let's see. Hold on a minute. Let me see what I got here. 
So this is July 20th. All right, hold on, y'all. I will put this July 20th meeting is going up right now. Sorry about that. For some reason, I thought that Brian and Michael could also do this. Okay. So. Huh, I don't know why that's doing that. So there we go. The oop, I got to change. Hold on a second. Uh, uh, Kelly, did you get my direct message to you? Uh, don't mm, you talking about? Did you do it in Netiquette? Uh, I was doing it through the whatever. However, I launched it through the system. It was in Netiquette, I don't think, but it has the, the the feel for it. But I didn't get a chance to even get started. But I think it might have gave me a zero because I. I had some power loss. Oh, um, that's fine. You still the int final skills exam. Uh, okay, the skills exam is inside of Netacad, so you can just do it over. It, you, we don't have to reset it. You just do another What's, schedule, another uh, recording or another session. Oh, is that kind of net? Because when I clicked on the on the link from the finals or underneath the finals, it took me straight to uh, like a, a um. I thought it looked like it looked like Netacat. Talking about, but I don't think I had to schedule anything. It looked just like Netacat with the wires and everything. But I didn't get a chance. No, to even if, start. if you're doing the, the final skills exam, that is inside of netlabs.stanley.edu. Okay, let me. I do that from there then. Okay. Okay, let me show y'all again where that's at. So when we log into, let me share my screen again. The the hands-on skills exam, you have to go under your you log in the NetLabs schedule lab for yourself. You'll find our course. Uh, I gotta remember what's that? There it is, right there. You'll find our course, and then the skills exam is this exam right here. Oh, CCA one okay. introduction right there. <laughs> right there. And now oh, I did man, I was enable, doing something different. Yeah, I enabled practice skills exams. I did enable down here. Do not get confused. Yeah. These are practice skills assessments. These, what? This the one down here is the active food. That's the one I did. Yeah, that this was I was you cannot, to. that does not count as your hands on final. Oh, this thank is for you. you to practice thank with. you so much. Your hands on final okay, good, is good. only inside of Net Labs. Yes, sir. Require Appreciate real it. Real equipment. We do not take packet tracer skills assessments for your hands on final. Okay. All right. All righty. Any other questions on that? I did turn those other ones on though, so you can use them to, to practice if you want to. Right, yeah. And I also did turn on the uh, practice written exam, so be aware of that too. Okay, all right, Michael, you ready to take over? Uh, yeah. All right, so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna pass it back to Michael and Michael, you can have a go at it. All right, um, so when we left off, me and Steve, we was going over the um, IPv6, so we got down to 1255, which goes over that UI64 process and um, the RAM delete uh, generated process. So this is when your RA message that is sent from the PC to the router and back from the router to the PC. If it's using Slack uh, or either Slack with stateless DHCP, this is when the client is gonna generate its own interface ID. So the client here is gonna know the the, the prefix portion of the address from the RA message, but it must create its own interface ID and the interface ID can be created using the EUI64 process or randomly generated 64-bit number. So it's showing here, your router sends that RA message and then the PC uses the prefix in the RA message and is either gonna use that EUI64 or it's gonna do a random 64-bit number to generate its own ID. And I think most of the time when it does this, I want to say it usually uses um, it's some of its MAC address. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Kelly or Brian. It, usually yeah, uses it, takes some its, of uh, it takes the MAC address, splits it in half, and puts FFFE in mm -hmm. the middle, and then uh, flips the seventh bit from the left, uh, whatever it happens to be. If it's a one, it flips it to a zero. If it's a zero, it flips it to a one. I did put in chat, why is this EUI 64 process dangerous? If someone is using their MAC address to create their uh, interface ID, why would that be dangerous? Anybody think of a reason? 
Dan's exactly right. It fingers your machine. So imagine you're in a country where they're trying to track you down or they're trying to find out who's using what. If EUI 64 is being used to create the interface portion of the IPv6 address, they can track it to your machine because they've got your uh, MAC address by taking the EUI 64, Soviet Union, China, um, anywhere, all over the world. Um, the good news is uh, almost no operating system today in existence uses EUI 64 anymore. They must all use a randomly generated uh, interface ID. So. And looking at the EUI process, the EUI 64 process, uh, this is when um, your Ethernet MAC address is usually represented at hexadecimal or made up of two parts. You have your organizational unit identifier, which is the OUI, which is the 24-bit uh, hexadecimal digit, uh, the vendor code assigned by the IEEE. And then you have your device identifier, which is going to be that unique 24-bit six hexadecimal uh, digits value coming in the OUI. And another good thing about the, the MAC addresses, I know usually in some tech support roles, you kind of get uh, real uh, acquainted with using, uh, going to Google to determine the MAC address of a device because you can go by the OUI and it's gonna tell you the maker of that device. And then you, the last uh, 24 bits will be the identifier. So this usually comes in handy whenever you're in a support role and you have a rogue device that may have a virus or may you have gotten on the network, you can kind of go to uh, Google and then you can uh, tell what kind of device it is. And here's going in, into showing uh, the EUI64 interface ID representing the binary and is made up of three parts. And then she goes through and shows that whole process where step one, it's gonna divide the MAC address between the OUI and the device identifier. So here's step one. Then step two is gonna insert that hexadecimal value, that FFFE, and it's, which is the binary of 1111, 1111, 1111, 1110. And usually that's a, a quick giveaway of that process, the EUI64. Usually I, I look for this FFFE to be in the address. Usually if I spot out that, I know that it's, it used the EUI 64 process. Then the third step is gonna convert the first two hexadecimal values or the OUI to binary. And then it's gonna flip the UL bit seven and this is uh the zero is bit seven and it's gonna change it to a one. So it's gonna flip that last bit from seven, from a zero in the zero seven bit and change it to a one. And here it shows that EUI generated interface ID. And like I said, a quick giveaway or an easy giveaway is usually you see that FFE in the middle of it. And then here it shows an example of a random, randomly generated interface ID. And as you see here, it's gonna use that uh, random process. And like uh, Kelly said before, most devices now will be using this random uh, generated bits here instead of doing the EUI 64. So looking at dynamic addressing for your IPv6, so your dynamic link local addresses, so all your IPv6, IPv6 devices must have an IPv6 link local address. Just like your global unicast addresses, you can also create your link locals dynamically, regardless of how you create your link locals. It's important to verify all your IPv6 address configuration. And here just shows um, that link local, link local address dynamically created using the FFE80 semicolon semicolon slash 10 prefix and the interface ID using the EUI64 process or a randomly uh, generated 64-bit number. And here it shows on your link local address on your Windows PC. So your operating systems such as Windows, they will typically use that same method for both Slack uh, created global unicast address and a dynamically assigned link local address. And here it shows those areas here as you see for that 
dynamic the EUI 64 gen generator, you see it has that FFFE. And then for the link local address, you also see where it put that FFFE in there also. Then your dynamic link locals on your Cisco routers. So your Cisco routers, they also can automatically create an IPv6 link local address whenever a global unicast address is assigned to the interface. Uh, by default, the routers use that EUI64 address to generate the interface ID for all of the link local addresses on your IPv6 interfaces. And here shows some examples of those IPv6 link local addresses using the EUI64 on this example here, the router. And one quick note about when the, when the router creates its address, it also uses the MAC address here. You'll see it uses the, the MAC address and it'll include that MAC address for the address and include that FFFE there also. So looking at some, uh, some verifying your IPv6 configurations, uh, like we went over before, so with a lot of stuff with your IPv6 commands, it's the same as IPv4, except for you're going to specify IPv6. So if we want to verify the, uh, the do an interface brief for IPv4, where well, we would do a show IP interface brief, just with IPv6, we need to specify that we're looking for IPv6 which is um, easy to get confused because sometimes, especially if you're in a rush and you're doing a configuration where you're timed, um, you may be intending to look at the IPv6 interfaces, but you're so used to going in and doing the show IP interface brief, and then you'll look at it and usually it, it costs a, a lot of time because then you have to go back and do show IPv6 interface brief. And so this here is going to show the uh, brief description of your interfaces, whether the interfaces are up, down. It's also a quick way of seeing if you have the addresses configured correctly. Then another one, we have your show IPv6 route, which is going to be used to verify that your IPv6 networks and specific IPv6 interface addresses have been installed in the routing table. So this here is good for whenever you're if you're using a um, interior gateway routing protocol, such as uh, OSPF or ERGRP, it's good for you can view your route table by doing the show IPv6 route. Then also your ping command for IPv6, it's going to be the same command as IPv4, where you're just doing your ping, and then you want to type in your IPv6 address. And it's the same concept. If you get a uh, response back and a success, it lets you know that that interface is up. Or if you're pinging another PC, it lets you know that that NIC is uh, operating correctly. Which is also used good, a lot of times used for troubleshooting in, the, in a real world example. A lot of times you're going to use that ping for troubleshooting and also your show IPv6 route and the show IPv6 brief. Okay, if you can drink, can you drink some water. Okay. And then, um, tell Dan to that. Here it shows the okay. a syntax well, checker be doing it for the to verify your IPv6 configuration. Yeah. Okay, well that sounds nice. And here's, like I say, it's a good uh tool to use to go through, and you can verify that you've um enter your commands correctly. So the first one here is showing the uh, enter the show command that would display the brief summary of your IPv6 interface status. So you can go and type in show IPv6 interface brief. Oh, it's where it's not the full shortcut. And here. So it's a good a good way to practice without having to bring up um, start up a whole packet trace. So you can just go here and, and it's gonna ask you different questions and you try to see if you can remember the commands to type them in. Uh, 
I see Dan has a question. Is IPv6 defaulted on the Cisco devices? Yes. So they're not defaulted. You have to enable it. You know, you have to do the command to show out uh, IPv6 unicast routing. So without that IPv6 unicast routing command, it'll still let you on the on your routers. It'll still let you configure the interfaces, but none of those interfaces will be routing for IPv6 until you en enable it using that IPv6 unicast routing command. And then on some of your older switches, I know on your uh, 2960s, with those, you have to change that SDM table to, to SDM prefer, and you set it to where it can do a dual. That way, it'll let you uh, enter your IPv4 as well as your IPv6 addresses on those interfaces. So that's that's one thing that a, a lot of my students will have issues with is on on the switches changing their SDM preferred template. So looking at the IPv6 multicast addresses. So here's going through some of your assigned IPv6 multicast addresses. It shows that uh, the IPv6 multicast addresses, they're similar to the IPv4 multicast addresses, and their uh, address used to send a single packet to one or more destinations, a multicast group. Uh, IPv6 multicast addresses, they have, have that prefix FF00 semicolon semicolon slash eight. So a quick note that the multicast addresses can only be destination addresses and not source addresses. And there are two types of your IPv6 multicast address, you have your well-known and you have your solicited node multicast addresses. And a, a good example for when something like this with the multicast addresses will be used, um, I always give the example of if you're um, ever at a healthcare facility or a hospital in, in the patient unit where the nurses have the biomed equipment where they can look at the patient monitor from the nurse's station, they see every patient room. So a lot of that information is being sent using multicast. So that's um, using a multicast address so that all that information from each room shows up on that one device. And here we get into some of our well-known IPv6 multicast addresses. So we have two common uh, IPv6 assigned multicast groups. We have an all nodes multicast group, which is the FF02 semicolon semicolon one. So this is the multicast group that all IPv6 enabled devices join. And then we have the FF02 semicolon semicolon two. This is the all routers multicast group. So this multicast group um, that all the IPv6 routers join. And a router becomes a member of this group when it's in the enabled using that IPv6 unicast routing command. So once that command is entered, this command here is what starts that IPv6 routing process. So once it's entered, then the router is gonna automatically join this all routers multicast group. And here's showing an example of your IPv6 enabled devices. I sends that ICMP version six router solicitation message to all the routers. Uh, multicast address, then that RS message request and uh, RA message from the IPv6 router to assist the device in its address configuration. And then that router responds with the RA message shown here. And then we have our solicited node IPv6 multicast addresses. So this is similar to the all nodes multicast address. And the advantage of the solicited node multicast address is that it's mapped to a special ethernet multicast address. So this allows the ethernet NIC to filter the, the frame by examining the destination MAC address without sending it to the IPv6 process to see if the device is ended. It's an intended target to the IPv6 packet. Uh, so Dan, it looks like, uh, are you asking, can you run it uh, simultaneously with IPv4?
Yeah, that, that's when you, yeah, you, you can hide. definitely do that. Yeah. It's called dual stack. Yes. And and if you notice, a lot of companies has already started to implement it. Um, you know, maybe uh, at your, your work location, if you look at your configurations, a lot of times you may be able to see where your device has an IPv4 as well as an IPv6. I've, you know, that, that's a good way for a lot of companies to, um, you know, change over without having a lot of hassle by having it already there. Um, on your switches, older switches, you have to enable that template for dual stack. Then on your routers, if there's, there's nothing to be enabled. You just go in and you do the, as long as you got IPv6 unicast routing, you should maybe go ahead and uh, enter that your IPv6 addresses on your interfaces. So getting into subnet, subnetting an IPv6 network. So here we're looking at subnet using the subnet ID. So here we're looking at the GUA with a 16-bit subnet ID, and you have your 48-bit global prefix, then you have your 16-bit subnet ID and your 64-bit for your interface ID. So if you look at that 46, 48 prefix plus the 16 bits, it's going to equal your slash 64 prefix. So the benefit of the of the 128-bit address is that it can support more than enough subnets and hosts per subnet for each network. So the address conservation is not an issue. Uh, here we're looking at your global routing prefix is a slash 48 and using the typical 64 bits for the interface ID, this will create a 16-bit subnet ID. So that 16-bit subnet ID can create up to 65,536 subnets. Then your 64-bit interface ID can support up to 18 quintillion host IPv6 addresses per subnet. So and everybody, I want to stop here just a second to yeah. give you an idea. This is what, let's go back up there a second, Michael. Okay. The actual recommendation is that each one of us at our home be given a slash 48. And then we will have 16 bits to assign subnets to our local PCs or devices on our local network. And so we can have 65,536 subnets of 18 quintillion hosts per subnet. Think about that. Uh, the hope then is that if we randomly assign IP addresses through that range that uh, and move a lot, move around on them, the idea that someone could port scan your computer would never ever be able to happen because computers aren't fast enough to scan that many addresses that fast. Um, so kind of kind of interesting that that's what they're going for. And now Michael's going to explain how simple subnetting is in IPv6, because if you thought IPv4 was hard, uh, IPv6 is beyond simple. So go ahead, Michael. So looking at your IPv6 subnet an example. So here's a short example where an organization was assigned the 2001 semicolon DB8, semicolon ACAD, semicolon, semicolon slash 48 global routing prefix with a 16-bit subnet ID. So this is going to allow the organization to create 65,536 subnets shown here in the figure. And pretty much if you look at the, the example here, so the organization was given the first 2001 DB8 ACAD slash 48. So that next hex tech is where they can go in and start creating their subnets. So as you see here in example here, they started with all zeros and then they go to all three zeros and one, zero, zero, two. So each of these is just own subnet. So you can do all zeros, semicolon, semicolon, one, that'll be host, uh, your first host bit, semicolon, semicolon, two, three, four, on, on up. And then you have your next subnet that you can use. So to me, it's, um, Usually, if I'm given a question and I have to create the subnets, usually I just follow in order of whatever subnet they give me. I know a lot of times for Cisco on some of your uh, examples, on some of your uh, packet tracers, 
they'll give you this address, semicolon, that they'll have their drop those zeros, and you'll have semicolon A, and then you're looking to create three more subnets. So usually from A, I go and create B, C, and D. And then I have my first host to be A, semicolon, semicolon one. My first host for B will be B, semicolon, semicolon one. Then for C, it'd be the same. So pretty much with, there's really no steps for subnet and IPv6. Um, like I said, usually uh, for me, if they was if they gave me a zero, and I had to go up for and create three more subnets, I, I know the first one's zero. Okay, I'm gonna go up one, two, three. Uh, Dan, I see you have a question. Uh, yeah, so for, for for machine one, so if we use this subnet for machine one, our first address would be dot semicolon semicolon one. So let me uh, I put it in chat, Michael. Two thousand one okay. DBA ACAD colon zero colon yep. colon one. That's the first yep. usable address all the way up. All the way up to undillion, right? Yep. Yep. So machine two would be just yeah, correct, Dan. You'd be semicolon, semicolon two. Machine no, it three. Would be not. It wouldn't be two colon no. colon one. Yeah, oh, he's got, no, he's he's right. He's saying for machine two, it's this. He's just saying for machine two, it's just colon yeah. colon two at the end. He he just that's not what, it's not what, it's not two colon oh, okay, colon, okay, two, okay, okay. colon colon two. Yeah. Yeah. So use that's pretty much all it is to it for your IPv6 subnet. Yes, co correct, Dan. So and then when you you need another subnet, let's say we had another router interface. We'll go up and start using one. So our first usable host will be one semicolon, semicolon one. Then for our next machine, it'll be one semicolon, semicolon two. Then our next one will be one semicolon, semicolon three. And actually, you don't have to go in, as long as you're in this subnet here, you don't have to go in order either. Um, you know, and, unless it specifies that. I know in, in a lot of the packet traces, it specifies which host to use. But uh, technically, anything in that, subnet here is going to work. And as you see, the last subnet that was created is the all Fs. So it'd be uh, FFFF, semicolon, semicolon one, FFFF, semicolon, semicolon two, and so on. So here's a, a good example of that subnet allocation. So pretty much here with the now that we have so many addresses with IPv6, we no longer really have to worry about the, you know, using the slash 30 for here to only have two hosts. You know, there, there's going to be a lot of addresses not used, but we have so many of them, it's not nothing big to worry about. So as you see here, where we took that same network, 2001 DB8 ACAD semicolon one for our first network here, and we assigned the router. That first host, semicolon, semicolon one. Then as you see for here, we got another network here. It's on this, the second network. So we use the number two and that first host, two, semicolon, semicolon one. Then we have our third network, which we have here. You see, we use it 2001, DB8, ACAD three. And we use the first host address here, second host address here. Then you see here we have a, our fourth network. Then we use the first host here. Then here we have our fifth network. We use our first host here. So if the first net is zero, can we ignore it with the semicolon, semicolon? So if it's zero here, you're going to need to at least put the one, one zero there. Did I answer your question, Dan? So the subnet would be. 
thought my question was if we're using that subnet of zero 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 can we replace that zero 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 in the subnet with just the double colons so we don't actually have to have a, a 16 bit subnet that should work what i just put in there it's 2001 dba acad colon colon one slash 64. Yeah. that right. should work yeah that should work okay because good. It, that would basically assume that in the uh last hex tet in the network portion it was a zero and then everything to that one was a zero so yes, that's, 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 that should that, work i haven't tried it but yeah, i haven't tried yes, it, it should work shoot that's what i was thinking thank you guys mm -hmm. And here's going over your our router configure with IPv6 subnets. Here shows an example of us configuring those interfaces from up above here. You see we with the same thing as doing your IPv4 in an uh, interface configuration. Except for you want to specify IPv6 address and type in your address and your slash 64 here. Then the same thing, the no shutdown to enable the interface. Then you can use exit to back out. Or you can just go into the next interface and configure it also and do no shutdown. So you can use the exit to back it out and go back in. Or the good thing about the routers, um, the OS is that you can go, as long as you know that inter that command you're looking for, you can jump right into the next interface without having to exit first. And then that no shutdown is just going to enable the interface. So it's going to bring it from disabled to enabled or from down to up. So that sums us up with uh, the IPv6. Do you have anything else to, to add, Kelly? Not that I can think of. Anybody have any questions about IPv6? One of the things to notice is many times it's already turned on on your machine. Um, so a lot of people don't realize that, but it's already turned on on, their, on your machine. Um, so just be aware of that. It's kind of um, being used for actually some nefarious purposes at this time which is kind of hard to believe, but because it's turned on and people don't realize it, um, it sometimes it's being actually used for um, nefarious purposes. But the uh, overall, it's, is there an enable all if commit? No, no, there's no way to enable all interfaces on a, on a router. Then there's a way to do a range command on a switch, uh, interface range, and you can do a shut, no shut, or a no shut on them, but typically it's switch ports are on anyway, so. But IPv6 is going to become more and more important as we move forward because everything's going to have to support it. Um, everything's going to need to be able to um, support it, run it, um, and eventually have it. So, and I'll just support what you're saying about a security risk. I know a decade ago we turned it on, and I remember talking to uh, we dual stack the network. We were talking to an administrator that uh, that was working on the server. This is maybe over a decade. It was a while ago, yeah. And uh, they they were doing maintenance, and they said, "Hey, why do we still see traffic?" Because they had shut their you know IPv4 stack, <laughs> and there was traffic going over their V6 uh, you know uh, interfaces without them realizing it, and uh, that was a pretty scary moment. Um, and if, you, if you're not careful with your firewall and having far, IPv6 firewall rules, in addition to the V4 firewall rules, uh, it's definitely could be, it's like a parallel network. So it's definitely it to be a security concern. And they're also uh, a lot of, many, many times now nefarious actors are actually using IPv6 tunneling. And so they're tunneling in IPv6 and you've got it turned on and don't even realize it's turned on. And so, and many times you think about it, even with their, um, unless you explicitly tell your IDS and IPS and your firewall even to be looking at your IPv6 traffic, it's not going to look at it. And so, you know, you've got that, really got to keep that in mind as you, as you, as you look at what's going on. But having said that, if you need it, obviously you can turn it on. If you don't need it, don't turn it on. It's like any service. If you don't need it, make sure it's turned off. By the way, does anybody know how to turn it off on a Windows machine? You might know. I'll show you real quickly. I was 
Let me show you. Michael, I'm going to take back over real quick. I'm going to share my screen. If you don't want it on on your PC, uh, by the way, it is turned on. Just uncheck IPv6. Uncheck the protocol itself and click OK, and that will turn off IPv6. By default, though, it's on. So be aware of that. that it's on on most machines. Um, so if you don't turn it off, then you are running it, and it is on by default on your machine. So pretty simple way to turn it off. Just a little checkbox, but many people don't do it, and you end up with end up with issues because of that. Are there any other questions about anything we've gone over today? Any questions about what's going on in the class overall? I know. Uh, thank. Uh, Brian and Michael for taking care of class last week, and I hope everyone's doing well. I've seen some of you've already put into the class your um, desire to take CCNA 2, so make sure you go into netacad.com and put in your response in the CCNA 2 discussion forum. If you are wanting to take CCNA 2, uh, then we will just get you signed up in a CCNA 2 class starting September 8th, and you will be able to take it for free. Okay, Mike, you have a question on CCNA 2? Go ahead. Either type it or unmute either one. I don't know. Well, go ahead, yeah, with your question, Mike. Uh, CCNA 2 is not quite as time intensive, I don't think. I think the big thing that you have to realize, that's no problem. Uh, Mike, the big thing about this first class is you had to learn how to use our NetLab system. You had to learn how to use Netacad. Um, I don't think the second class is as uh, intensive. I personally like the second class better than any of the three classes. I think it's the most fun. Um, I think it because you're getting into uh, VLANs, inter VLAN routing, um, static routing, those types of things. I think it's the, one of the best classes, if not the best of the three, quite honestly. Um, so I don't think it takes quite as much time. Um, right now, our plan is for Kirby Simerson to teach CCNA 2s for us. Um, Kirby can only teach two courses, but he'll teach two of the CCNA 2s. And if we have three CCNA 2s, which if everyone takes it that's part of this class, uh, then we will need three CCNA 2s. Um, then Michael, Brian, or I will pick up a CCNA 2. I don't know. We haven't decided on that one right now. So, uh, Devin, you're saying, can it be taken uh, some other time than the fall? I cannot promise you funds will be available. Um, now, if you're part of the HBCU project, yes, I can promise you funds will be available. You could wait and take it in the spring. If you're not part of the HBCU project, I cannot promise you that these funds will be available in this, uh, later. Um, we, they should be uh, because, quite honestly, my administration has put a fairly large chunk of change um, into allowing us to do scholarships, but I can't promise you that. So um, if you are part of the HBCU project, yes, you're, you could just wait and take season A2 in the spring. The only thing I got to say is this. Um, be careful waiting too long. I, I would say, um, I know if you, even if you are teaching a lot in this, realize too that we're going from September 8th to December 8th. And so there's more time in the spring, in the fall than there really is uh, than, than you had in the summer. Um, so you've got a little more time in the fall. Um, I, I would say if you've got any time in the fall at all to take it, take it um, because that would be um, keeping you in track and keep you going. Otherwise, you're looking at not being able to do season A3 until you know uh, summer of 2023. Okay. Kelly, this is Lorraine. Can I ask a quick question, please? Yeah, shoot. What's up? Uh, Karen's out of the country, but she is actually on the phone texting me. She would like for me to sign her up. Okay. Can I get in and sign her up, or can you do it? Um, she can just do it when she gets back. I mean, we're not. You know, we've got till the 14th. As long as it's in, in there by the 14th of August, we're going to get you in the class. Okay. Yeah, so that's, I'm not, but I just put that, I just put that into the class to make it easy for us to do it. Um, so, yeah, as long as she gets it in there before this class ends, so that's fine. Okay, thanks. I mean, okay. she's in Italy and she's still talking to me and I'm hey. giving her the heads up. I got you. I got you. Man, I wish I was in Italy. Yeah, so do I. Yeah, of course. I think I think it's as hot in Italy as it is here. So, yeah, she said it is. It's baking. In Europe is post. baking right now. It's it's horrific. Um, from what I've been hearing from my friends in Germany, it, it's it's terrible. 
Okay, everyone, I believe we are now at the end of our hour. So I'm going to stop the recording.